Hello everyone. Okay, I'm going to bring to you the Sunday School lesson for um, November 6, which is lesson number 10. And our title of the lesson is Obedience and Justice. Our lesson text is coming from Exodus 23, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 9. Um, our golden text reads, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and the righteous slay thou not. For I will not justify the wicked. And that's coming from Exodus 23 and 7. I'm going to read the introduction, whisper a word of prayer, and get into the lesson. Obedience in society is the theme of our lesson in this final unit. Um, with justice being the focus of today's lesson in particular, justice is the principle and practice of moral righteousness. Equity, righteousness, and fairness are terms related to justice. And we all seem to have an idea of what they mean. For centuries, however, um, thinkers have debated how standards of justice have come into being. Are they inborn? Are they dictated by powerful authorities? Have they evolved to meet the changing needs of society? Are they determined by common consent? God's word sweeps aside all these abstract arguments and simply demands that we practice the standards of justice God's, God has established. We need not wonder what they are, for they are clearly taught, and they are based not only on what he commands, but also on what he is like. So a call to be just, as recorded in God's law, is a call to be like God. Let me whisper a word of prayer. Lord, thank you, God, for this day, Lord God. Thank you for blessing us, Lord God, to see a day which we've never seen before and a day we'll never see again. God, please help us to do the best to bring glory to your name, Lord God. I pray that you teach us in this lesson how to be just to all men, Lord God. Help us to be righteous in all that we do, Lord God, when we're dealing with others, Lord God. Help us to love, Lord God, your way, Lord God. Now may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, we have three outlines for this lesson. Um, the first outline is impartiality in legal cases. That's Exodus 23, 1 through 3. The second outline is compassion in everyday conduct. That's Exodus 23, um, verses 4 and 5. And the third outline is integrity in human relations. And that's Exodus um, 23, 6 through 9. Um, a scripture in Lester, Texas, the scriptures are verses 1 through 9. Thou shalt not raise a false report, but put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous um, witness. Thou, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after um, many to rest judgment. Neither shalt thou countenance um, a poor man in, the, in his cause. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hated thee, thee lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of, of thy poor for his cause. Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not. For I will not justify the wicked. And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blinded the wise, and per, and I'm sorry, and perverted the words of the righteous. Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So the first outline is impartiality in legal cases, verses one through three. I read all the verses, but I'm just going to break it down into the sections. So here we have impartiality in cases. Exodus um, 1 through 3. Thou shalt not raise a false report, put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude do, to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. Um, I'm going to be reading a lot from the expositor because it really um, kind of breaks it down really plainly um, where we can understand what the lesson is teaching. Our last unit of study seeks to explore our responsibilities to society around us as outlined in Israel's law. Um, even though we are not under the law, God does intend that we uphold, that we uphold the eternal principles that is, is, that is based, um, for they reflect his own nature. They reflect God's nature. 
This week's passage um, is part of the code. Part of the code God gave Israel at Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments provided the basis for more detailed civil and ceremonial laws that follow. Our text begins with the application of the command, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And that's verse 16. Um, a truthful witness, Exodus 1 and 2. And we know that it, um, the, the first verse was, Thou shalt not uh, raise a false witness. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be in a... I'm sorry. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not, not thine hand with the wicked to be an un unrighteous witness. And this deals especially um, with lawsuits. This right here deals especially with lawsuits. It pictures a person conspiring to bring false charges against an innocent person and, en and enlisting malicious reports of another person to do so. And the Israelites were commanded, they were commanded never to participate in these kind of schemes. And this is something that we see a lot of times in the um, in the in in the justice system here, you know, in America, where um, false charges are brought up against an innocent man, and then of course the the guilty um, goes free. And so um, the Bible tells you not to um, not to bring false charges against an innocent person. That's just plain and simple. Don't bring false charges against an innocent person because, you know, um, that will determine the rest of his life. And sometimes, you know, people die in those situations. And so you, if, if you were that type of person, then you would play a part in, um, you know, messing up that person's life by bearing a false witness um, of the, I'm um, sorry, of a, of a person that's not, that's not guilty. To raise a false report implies both receiving it from another and spreading it further. So you can get a false report from someone, receive it from them, you spread it further, um, and you it's a false um, report from a person, from someone you heard it from. Get the truth. Don't always rely on what someone tells you because that can be real. Um, that can become a, a major problem. Um, not only were those to be those two complicit, not only were, um, you know, there were people that were complicit in bringing about false charges um, against people in the Bible, and they gave um, specifics if you go to 1 Kings tw um, chapter 21. Read 1 Kings chapter 21, 1 through 15, and it talks about um, Naboth, um, who was con condemned by two worthless fellows that King Ahab could seize, could, so that King Ahab could seize his vineyard. So go and read that first Kings that's twenty one one through fifteen now sometimes the temptation um to be unjust is a matter of following the crowd, and we do know that it's just a matter of following the crowd a lot of times us as believers follow the crowd into doing the wrong things because we don't want to be singled out as as i guess as being the good guy, which you know there's no such thing as being the good guy if you save if you save. You're saved from doing those wrong things and just don't follow the crowd. But sometimes temptation becomes unjust. I'm sorry, become unjust is a matter of following the crowd. Therefore, the law also cautions thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. A lot of times, what do we do? We follow the crowd. You follow the multitudes to do evil. Neither shall thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Decline here means... To turn aside, to lean, so to lean toward the majority and thus um, leave the path of righteousness. So here I'm going to read it again. Thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Decline here means to turn aside or to lean toward the majority, okay, and thus leave the path of righteousness. We often think peer pressure is a special problem for young people. Your peer pressure is for everyone. Um, persons of any age can be tempted to succumb to peer pressure, any age. No one likes to be ridiculed for being different. No one likes to be ridiculed for being different. But be if you if, if it causes being right, then go ahead and ridicule me if I'm going to be doing the right thing. Um, when issues of right and wrong are involved, it becomes easy to justify our wrong decisions. It's really true. When issues of um, right and wrong are involved, it becomes 
easy to justify our wrong decisions by appealing to the opinion of the majority. And that is very true. Um, those who allow the crowd to shape their opinions and actions are always susceptible to this su susceptible to this evil. Only those who have developed an inner fortitude and mastered the divine standard to do right can resist the pressure to conform to unjust ways. I'm going to read this again. Those who allow the crowd to shape their opinions and actions are always susceptible to this evil, to doing the wrong thing, to doing evil. Um, you know, a lot of times you, you people would like, like you'll see people who maybe their child got in trouble and, they, and you know, the, the thing is, is, oh, he's such a good, he's a good kid. He would have never done nothing like that. Well, following the crowd sometimes will cause you, and then it just brings out the person that you are. If you're going to succumb, if you're going to succumb to evil, then that's just pretty much who you were anyway. Um, now we're going to move on to... Um, no, let me just read this. Blindness blindness to class. And this is talking about the poor. Um, verse 3. Neither shall thou countenance a poor man in this cause. And it's talking about blind blindness to the, to the poor. Now, um, perhaps a more common temptation is to favor the rich in court cases since they are influential... influential influential in the community and have power to harm those who oppose them and that's normally the case you know people use money as power to to get what they want and that's just not the way things are done with god but it's also possible to because of compassion to favor the poor even when the case is even when their cause is unjust okay but god's law is clear justice must be blind to every level of, uh, to every level of social class now, we might sympathize with the poor, the poor man who steals um, food to feed his family. We might sympathize with him because it's like, oh, he's having a hard time, just like Robin Hood. You rob from the rich, you give to the poor, and you're supposed to be doing a good thing. So, you know, we might sympathize with that poor man who goes out and steals food to feed his wife and children. But he is just as guilty, um, just as guilty of thievery as a wealthy thief. So, he, you know, it doesn't matter your status or poor, rich. If you've done wrong, if you've stolen something, you're, you're guilty. That's just it. We must remember that being poor or oppressed does not make one a good person. It does not. Sin um, inher is inherited by all and regardless of social class. So we must always be sensitive to the needs of the poor and show compassion in meeting their needs. But we must not compromise if they've done something wrong. We cannot compromise um, the injustice. So now I'm going to move on to um, the to, um, verse, the next outline, the second outline, which is compassion in every conduct. So the first outline was impartiality to legal cases, okay? Now we have compassion in every everyday conduct. If thou meet thine enemy's um, ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou shalt see the ass of him, I'm not cussing, this is the Bible, this is the word of God. I don't usually like to say that word, but it's right here, and I got to read the scriptures like they're here. So if thou shalt see the ass of him that hated thee lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear him to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Now, returning property. Here is talking about um, if you have an enemy who's lost their donkey, um, the thing for you to do is to bring it back to him. Um, compassion does does have a role in justice, however, when everyday activities are involved. And this should be seen in one's conduct towards an enemy. You know, the Bible tells us, God tells us to love our enemy. It's not easy to love someone or um, show compassion to someone that really, really, really treats you bad or really is really, really evil or mean. It's not easy. But we're, we're commanded to love our enemy. And this will be a strong temptation if a person recogni recognizes a stray animal as belonging to his enemy. That will be a strong temptation to say, oh, he's my enemy. I'm not going to return it because that's just how um, our nature is. Our nature is, is, is a un we have a, a hard time with forgiveness. And that's something that we need to really, really work on is forgiveness. If someone has wronged you or, or you feel that they've done something wrong or they didn't treat you right, um, God shows us forgiveness. We didn't even deserve his forgiveness. But God loved us anyway that he saved us from our sins, sent his son to die for our sins. Jesus came and died for us. And so 
what better way should we, you know, be, be forgiving? But we know that there's a strong temptation if a person recognizes a stray animal to, to return it, to return. And so it, the thing is to return evil for evil. So it's like, he's evil, I'm not going to return it. But that's just not what we're supposed to say. To say the enemy deserved to lose his animal for his nasty behavior and that should, um, and, and he should therefore have to go find it on his own. But this is not God's way of dealing with, um, with enemies. It's just not God's way of dealing with enemies. Our thing would be, you know, let the enemy, he deserved to lose his animal. Let him go find it on his own. But it's not God's way of dealing with it. He sets an example for us by sending his blessings on the just and the unjust alike. And he sent his son to die for us and provide salvation while we were yet sinners. So God didn't um, give us what we deserve. So we need to show some compassion. We are therefore commanded. We're commanded, like I stated before. We're commanded to love our enemies and to um, live peace, peaceably with them. And even to provide for their daily needs. It's not always easy, but it can be done. So now he is assisting in difficulty. The Israelites were commanded not only to return lost property to an enemy, but also to help free his to free his burden that caused the collapse that the collapse that he had. The donkeys sometimes were not they were not fed well. They were sometimes overfed. They were they were overloaded. Um the poor animals were not always able to stand up and, and, and do the, what the work they were supposed to do. So here again would have been a strong temptation to turn away from the problem. You know, sometimes we see a problem and we don't want to deal with it. And, you know, there's a, just a strong temptation to turn away from the problem. After all, it was probably due to mistreatment of the animals, but that's still not, that's not for us to um, judge. That's not for us to try to reconcile. We're only supposed to help and do what God tells us to do. Is to love our enemies. That's God's command. We need to be obedient. Like the lesson says, in justice. We need to be obedient to God's command. Now we're going to go to the last outline, which is integrity and human relations. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of the poor in this cause. Verses 6 through 9. Verse 7. Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and the righteous slay thou not. For I will not justify the wicked. God does not justify the wicked. So if we're doing wicked things, he would not justify us. Um, and thou shalt, not, thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blinded the wise, and per perverted the words of the righteous. Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers um, in the land of Egypt. The principles of judgment found in the remaining verses of our passage can be applied to all personal relationships, but they have special applications um, to those charged with government, governmental functions and decisions. The way they handle their judicial and political duties may affect many kinds of people, and that is true. The way the justice system is in, in this country, it affects many kinds of people, and it's not the most of the time it's not fair most of the time it's not even right but it's just the way they are and god's gonna god's gonna deal with them so now upholding the needy verse six thou shalt not rest the judgment of the of thy poor in his cause the first command this is the first okay this is the first command earlier the danger of um compassion overriding justin is dealing with the um the I'm sorry, with the poor was cited, resulting in poor being treated too um, leniently. Now here is the opposite, and more common, dangerous scene. Rest means to pervert. Here, rest, when it says rest, means to pervert. In hearing a dispute involving a poor person, the magistrate is not to show bias in his cause just because he's poor. He is not to show bias. So here we have supporting the innocent. We go to verse 7. Chapter yeah, verse 7. Israel's law also cautioned, keep thee far from a false matter. And the innocent and the innocent and the righteous slay thou not, and I would not justify the wicked. Now the false matter refers to a false charge against an innocent person. So all of this is um a lot of this is talking about the civil, um, it's just talking about the the law, um, the justice system. And here it's just saying. The false matter refers to a false charge against 
an innocent person, which is which is always happening in the law. God is going to deal with them. Officials are um, ordered to keep themselves far from such an accusation, but they don't. They do it all the time. They must guard themselves from even thinking about such a false, false charge. Just for even thinking about it, they need to guard themselves. To slay an innocent and righteous, I'm sorry, to slay the innocent and righteous is to condemn to is to condemn them to death through an unjust sentence. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Is that um, you can someone can accuse an innocent person and that innocent person goes to jail and because they are so stressed out, because of you know, where they are, you know, they become ill, they become sick and you know, some of them die. So to slay an innocent person here. Um, and righteous is to condemn them to death um, through an unjust sentence. Capital punishment has its place, but those with the power to inflict it must be exceedingly careful. They must be careful um, to yield it justly. Otherwise, the innocent perish while the guilty go free. So sad. Now listen to this. God judges all things perfect, and we know that. God's perfect. God's word is perfect. He judges. He sees all things perfect. But God um, judges all things perfectly. And he would not allow the wicked to escape justice. He just would not allow it. So he's going to deal with it. He will hold accountable the real criminals in the case. Um, regardless of this, the decision of the human. You know, the human, human, you know, them doing the case. He will also punish the unjust judges who perpetrated the miscarriage of justice. Um, a lot of times we, we, we see a lot of miscarriage of justice in our justice system. And then, you know, we ask the question, Lord, how long? How long would they continue? But you see that a lot of things that went on back in the day, they can't get away with that stuff as easy as they did um, before. And God is not going to continue to let them just keep getting away with this injustice. He's just not. He will also punish the unjust judges. Like I said, he was going to... Um, pushed him for mis, um, you know, mis, miscarriage of justice. And this is the fact um, routinely ignored by crooked politicians. Right. They have deceived their con constituents and preserved their reputations. Exactly. That's exactly what they do. Just like a lot of times you get tired of the time it's time to vote. Everybody's coming on talking about what they're going to do. And when they get in there, they don't, they, they pretty much don't do what they promised they would do. But they have forgotten their guilt before God, and God is going to deal with them. So now here we're going to verse verse 8, and it's talking about refusing bribes. And when it's talking about thou shalt take no gift, it's talking about taking a bribe. And we know the bribe is you pay somebody to do something, to do, um, it's like giving it's like giving gifts for favors received. It's like, you know, I'll give you a gift, and you do me a favor. It's like it's taking a bribe. Thou shalt not take shall take no gift the, the law commanded this is a prohibition of bribery the corrupt practice of giving gifts for favors received the command here is directed to the government government of government official who is um easily susceptible to this powerful temptation many of the evils already mentioned in our passage come about because of bribery bribery the righteous um, poor lose their, their cases simply because their adversaries have money to pay off the judges. And this is really something here. I, I know someone who um, was fighting a, a custody battle with the, um, you know, she had to go to court and everything. And, and the dad was really a deadbeat. He, he, he just didn't like her. And so he wanted to take the son from her because he was just mean. He was just evil, just being spiteful. And... She went, and of course, she didn't have any money. He did, because of course, he had drug money, you know. So, he had money. He had plenty of money. So, she told the judge what he did. The judge didn't care. He just brushed it off. And so, she was basically told, because you don't have money, um, he's going to end up with your child. And, that, and and that's really sad. But it's just that's just the way it is. Many evils... I mentioned our pastors are because of bribery. And I'm not saying that he bribed them, but it was the fact that he had money. So he had the money to win his case. And whether it was right or wrong, they still favored the person with the money. Now, bribery was one of the most common forms of political corruption. And scripture, scripture gives numerous examples of it. And it lists a lot of scriptures. So if you want to write these down, Numbers 22 and 7, um, 
22, 16 through 17. You got 1 Samuel 8, 8th chapter, verses 1 through 3. You have 2 Kings um, chapter 18, verse 31. And then you have um, Amos chapter 5, verses 12. Scripture also condemns it repeatedly, for it makes a mockery of justice. This is because a bribe blinds even wise leaders. Money, I tell you, money makes people do crazy things. Crazy things. A judge who normally displays clear-sighted wisdom is so, um, is so, you know, they get so hypnotized by money um, dangled before him that he can no longer see the issues fairly. It's bribery. You dangle that money in front of somebody, it changes a lot of things. A bribe also perverts the words of the righteous. The words here refers to the verdicts normally righteous of righteous judges. Um, but it could also be translated causes or matters. In this case, it would be it would mean that bribes subvert the causes brought to court and the righteous are denied the justice due. God is absolutely just and fair, and we know that. It's no wonder this practice is abandoned, is abandoned, um, is abomination to him. So this practice is abomination to God. So but so the last verse is befriending the stranger, um, which is verse nine, and it reads, Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So here he was just saying the Israelites of all people should have um understood strangers. You know that the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt, the Lord said. Therefore, um, there four centuries um, there were part of God's sovereign plan to shape their nation and, and, and solidify their identity. It was not a pleasant experience for Israel since they had been sorely mistreated by the Egyptians. It, sh it should have taught them, among other lessons, to treat aliens well. You treat strangers well. Here then in Israel's law are some essential features of just living, impartiality in court proceedings, compassion in daily conduct, and integrity in all human relations. Since these principles are embedded in the very nature of God, they are repeated for us in the New Testament. And if we would please him, we must practice them. So we need to be obedient in justice. We need to practice um, being obedient um to um being just to, to everyone do not you know falsely accuse someone but we just need to be um obedient to god's word and to continue to treat others the way that god tells us to treat them i pray that this lesson helps someone and um that we continue to be those christians to love our enemies and to, to treat those who we say we love better than we really do. Um, may God bless you and keep you is my prayer. God bless you.